There is no denying that the deep web has become a popular topic in recent years. The deep web refers to any part of the internet not indexed by popular search engines. The most popular way to access the deep web is through the Tor browser, which was designed by the Navy in the mid-90s. With as many as 2.5 million daily users, Tor, also referred to as the Onion Router, works to secure online privacy. There are a few things you need to know before venturing off to the dark part of the web. There are sick and disturbing things to be found. Because of its nature, the deep web is a flocking ground for sadists, cults, pedophiles, rapists, and murderers. This has caused law enforcement to crack down on a lot of illegal websites on the deep web. Since the start of August, as many as 50% of the sites have vanished from existence. But there is still a long way to go. The deep web was even used for communication by activists in the Middle East to start the Arab Spring Revolution. Criminal activity and malevolence may fill the deep web, but there will always be a shroud of mystery surrounding the last uncensored place on Earth. Since the dawn of time, man has been blessed with curiosity. You already know the other saying about curiosity. Number one. When I was a kid, I used to live in a house where I started to feel things almost from day one. I started sleepwalking while having nightmares of a woman haunting me through a tunnel and me not being able to scream out of panic. The owner had mentioned when we moved in that in that house, a woman had aborted a child and thrown it in one of the bathrooms, which we never used because the feeling in there was not welcoming, and she had killed herself afterwards. Point was that whenever I was playing, I would get this feeling of being observed or a presence that would stand behind you, stuff of that sort. I remember I was in that house from 5 to 11 years old. The nightmares would be awful. So I told my mom, and she told me that in the dreams, I should tell the woman to stop haunting me. Next time I dreamed of her, I breathed and told her to stop. Next thing I know, I'm talking to her in the dream. I don't remember about what. Never had the nightmares again, nor woke up to sleepwalking. Fast forward until my 8 year old I was trying to sleep and I had my blanket at the top of my head and had a radio with music next to me. In a moment, I feel something weird in the air and I picked through the blanket to take a look at my room. There was a black silhouette standing next to me. There it was. It didn't move. Next thing I know is that I wake up the next morning. And I told myself, how did I fall asleep while looking at that thing? You ask me, I felt as if I was sent to sleep by the thing because I wasn't sleepy at all. Nobody would with a thing like that. Fast forward to my 10 year old self, the worst thing that had ever happened to me in that house. My mother had told me not to go to bed too late at night because I was in my room watching TV. She went to bed at 11 or midnight. I turned off the TV and opened my door to go to the bathroom. My house had a long hallway from the front door, going through the living room, kitchen, and finally my room at the end of the hall. The bathroom that we used was at the back of the house and I had to, in the way, pass by the hall. I was always afraid and felt something was watching me so I looked at the hall when I went by. This time, I did too. I opened my door and went out of the room and looked, and suddenly, 
I saw a little white kid with a blanket. He opened his arms as if he had wings and screamed at me and I freaked out and ran to my mother's room that was in the back of the house. While I was running, I felt as if it was running behind me. My mother's room, which was never locked, was locked. I had to scream for about seven seconds while she woke up and opened the door. The longest seven seconds of my life. With that presence behind me, I looked straight at the door. I felt that if I looked back to the corner, I would see something. She went out and checked the house. Found nothing. Number two. So I'm 16 years old and I can drive. Every weekend or so, me and my two buddies drive around at night and see what kind of trouble we can get ourselves into. Well, this past weekend, we started getting bored because we had visited every place that we usually go to. Until one of my friends, Jeff, suggested that we visit the lake behind the local middle school. Keep in mind that this is at around 9.30 at night. The middle school is surrounded by houses, but following a few roads and turns you end up in a heavily wooded area. Going down a two lane road with a dense forest on both sides of the road and a few houses here and there. You eventually end up at the lake where there is a dock you can fish off of. The dock is a public area so we weren't breaking any rules by being there. We spent some time at the lake until we got bored of that, so my other friend, Derek, wanted to explore the area a little bit, so we hopped in the car and made our way out of the dock parking lot. We drove across the street to where another street intersected the main street that we crossed. The road we were on, now, had no houses and was very dark. It was just that the atmosphere kind of freaked us out, but this is where it gets weird. We were still traveling on that road when we came across two cars, parked on the left side of the road facing the opposite direction we were. The car in front we assumed must have had been there for a while because it was off and was frosted over. The car behind it was on and running, with the inside lights on and the passenger door still open. This really freaked us out so we drove a little bit ahead to turn around and went back to the end of the road. As we passed the two cars, nothing had changed so we weren't too scared. It was only about two and a half seconds after we passed the cars when we noticed a dull flash on the top of the trees in front of us, as if someone took a picture from behind us. I hit the brakes and opened my window and stuck my head out of the window and looked behind us. There was a dark figure standing in the middle of the road. I couldn't see any features because the lights from the building were masking its front. The figure was average in height and was standing with its legs spread apart. Its arms were at its sides and appeared to be holding something square in its hand. I slammed on the gas pedal and peeled out of there. Jeffrey saw it, but Derek didn't get a good look. We were all shaken up about the whole event. I no longer go out driving to unknown areas at night. Number three. When I was 19, I moved into a duplex with my brother and some friends. This particular duplex was a century home that was remodeled in the 80s and it was a top floor and bottom floor. As it opposed to side by side, this particular duplex was a century home that was remodeled in the 80s and it was a top floor and bottom floor and happened to be the oldest house in my nowhere Midwest town. We moved in and everything was great. It was divided into two three bedroom apartments with me on the bottom floor and my bro on the top. The house was built in 1895 and was known by our whole town for its imposing turn of the century and was quite large. Six bedrooms, two baths, two kitchen and a basement. We all noticed some strange things about the basement immediately. Intense feeling of dread, cold even when it's blaring hot outside, 
but the rest of the house was not too alarming. The most unsettling part was the stains. In the old concrete shower in the basement, there was a stain that looked like a large amount of blood splatter from a gunshot about four feet up the wall. We called this the kid headshot stain. There were some other ominous stains that looked like someone had smeared shit on the walls, but we weren't too unnerved. That is until a few events took place. One night, when we were finally all settled, we were talking, smoking, and generally having a nice time, when, as often occurs, there's a lull in conversation and everyone was just sitting there in silence. Then I heard a cha-ching cha-ching, exactly like a bell, exactly, I had commented, whose phone was that? That was very realistic, and everyone kind of looked around and admitted that they had no such text ringtone. We all looked at each other kind of dumbfounded, and my friend said, so we all definitely heard that, right? And everyone nodded, but we brushed it off. About a month or two later, I was in the whole house alone, which was extremely rare. I lived with a lot of people there, at one time 10 others, so alone never happened. I was just sitting, watching TV in the living room, listening to my roommate's door gently opening and closing, tapping against the frame. This seriously was happening for over an hour, and I of course attributed it to the wind. But I eventually was annoyed enough to the point where I wanted to stop it. I peered down the dark hallway and watched the door, swinging back and forth, gently wrapping the frame. I clicked on the light switch, and I shit you not, as fast as the light can travel, the door instantly stopped moving. I quickly said fuck this and let my friend deal with it. He wedged a shirt in the door and said fuck you ghost. My friend's boss had heard about some odd experiences in the house and was an amateur paranormal dude. Would say investigator but he wasn't super serious with it. He asked what the creepiest part of the house was. We all said the attic. Though none of us had an experience up there. It was by far the most sorrow-filled part of the house. He got a tape recorder and went up there. Shortly after, heard a thud, like someone falling to their knees. Our friend's boss came down a few minutes later. Lightly sobbing, wiping tears from his eyes, he said he hadn't cried so hard since he was a tyke. He said he just felt dread take over his body and he didn't know what else to do. He was overcome by something. That was it. Not much of anything scary that anyone spoke of at least for the entire two years I lived there. It wasn't until I recently started thinking about it. Our lives became kind of shitty after that. There was always at least one or two of us there who were horribly depressed. A few of us, myself included, began to develop alcoholism. One of my roommates became a horrible heroin addict no one could be around, and there was just generally a black cloud above that place. My brother moved out, and I did about a month later, and I haven't felt better in a long, long time. Everyone who stayed there is engulfed in alcoholism, depression, and the same shitty circles people like that find themselves in. I don't really know if there was a ghost or what haunting that place, but all I know is that I'm glad I got the fuck out of there. This story is about an experience I had on the deep web. For those of you who don't know, the deep web is pretty much the hidden internet. It isn't indexed by search engines and you need special software to go on it. It is several thousand times bigger than the surface internet which can be reached by Google, Yahoo, and Bing. It is also home to many illegal things. 
You can buy stolen guns, any drug you can imagine, stolen phones. You can even hire hitmen. Any illegal thing you can imagine is on the deep web. I never had a great childhood. My dad was gone all the time and my mom was too. When she was home, it was normally verbal and physical abuse. I always needed to have a way to escape it all, whether it was playing video games, watching movies, or even drinking. One day, I was invited over to a friend's house for a sleepover. When I got there, he immediately told me he had something to show me. We went upstairs and he showed me his laptop. He said he had gotten onto the deep web. We stayed up till late at night, browsing through all the interesting things on the deep web. He showed me how to use it and I took some notes. The next day, I decided to try it out for myself. I downloaded the software and I was good to go. When on the deep web, there is a page full of links. In order to go to the sites, you keep clicking on the new links that pop up. At first, it was very boring. Tons of dead websites or disgusting ones filled with videos of real people getting killed. Eventually, I found a forum. I can't remember what it was about, but I asked how to get to any interesting sites that weren't illegal. One guy sent me a link and said it was a site that contained leaked government documents. I thought that was interesting, so I clicked on it. When I pulled up the page, I was pretty fucking shocked. It was a whole bunch of videos of people getting tortured, raped, and murdered in the most horrible of ways. I have a pretty strong stomach, so I was ready to ignore and just exit out. But I realized that all the videos were playing at once. When I moved the mouse over one, there was no bar that let you pause or stop it. That's when it hit me. These were all thousands of live streams. I clicked on one that said homeless man kidnapped in my basement. In it, a man was tied to a chair covered in blood. To his left was a table, and on it was a whole bunch of tools like axes, knives, drills, hammers, and there was a hooded man standing by it. On the right of the live stream, there was a chat box, and people were requesting the hooded man to do various things like cut off the homeless man's hand or rip out his hair. Eventually, one man in the chat box said that he would pay several Bitcoin for the hooded man to gouge out the homeless man's eyes. The hooded man agreed and grabbed what looked like a fork off the table and began to walk to the homeless man. I quickly closed the live stream, but I could still hear it. I tried to leave the site, but it was frozen and I could only hear the horrible sounds coming from the stream. A few seconds later, the sounds stopped, and a chat box appeared in the center of the screen. I couldn't exit out, but then in the box somebody typed, Hello, how did you like the site? I paused for a moment, not sure if it was some kind of automated message, but then he typed again. Are you going to answer? I stayed frozen in place, but eventually typed in, Who is this? The guy explained that he was the owner of the site, and that he liked to greet first-time users whenever he could. I got a disgusted look on my face, and this is where things got really scary. In the chat box, the man typed, It's rude to make faces, Jake. My eyes got wide, and I noticed my webcam was on. When I always keep it off. Also, how the fuck did he know my name? I quickly covered up the webcam with a sticky note and typed, How do you know my name? I'm calling the police. There was a brief pause and then horrifyingly, a whole bunch of data was posted in the box. I looked at it and realized what it was. Everything about me, my name, my email, my address, age, it even had all my parents' info as well. I panicked and shut off my computer. I hoped that would. 
I hoped that that would be the end of it. I did a complete wipe of my computer's data and went to get a drink. I was under a lot of stress. That night, my mom said she wouldn't be home. She didn't say where she was, but at this point in my life, I didn't care. My dad was of course nowhere to be seen. I couldn't sleep, so I stayed up watching a movie. I fell asleep on the couch. I don't know why, but at about 2.30 in the morning I woke up. The TV was still on and it gave off a dim light. But when I opened my eyes a little more, I almost screamed. There was a man standing just a few feet away from me with a mask on. I flew off the couch and darted for the door. I heard heavy footsteps coming after me. I flung open the door and I ran outside screaming as loud as I could trying to get somebody's attention. I looked behind me and I saw the man. He was running and he was running faster than me. I screamed louder and I noticed I had tears running down my face. Then, a bag wrapped around my head and I was pushed to the ground with such force I felt blood in my mouth. I heard a car speed up beside me and I was being dragged to the sound of it. They were taking me away and I was probably going to be on that site. I had almost expected death when the man with the mask screamed in pain and dropped me. I pulled the bag off my head and saw a van speed away and I saw my neighbor hitting the masked man with a baseball bat. The police arrived, took the masked man in, and eventually caught the van and shut down the site. My mom and I moved out, and I will never, ever go on the deep web again, and I encourage others to never go on it either. And this story happened to my friend on the deep web. I had a pretty scary experience too, but mine was a few years ago. This story happened to my friend just one week ago. To give you some context, this is the friend that showed me how to get on the deep web. He has always been really fascinated with it, but after my horror story experience with deep web hackers, he pretty much took a long break. He didn't resume using the deep web until after about a year of my story, but he didn't tell anyone. He would buy stolen Apple products, drugs, etc. About a week or two ago, he was buying some coke. It wasn't from the seller he normally buys from though. But it was really cheap, so he gave the seller his address and a fake email he used so they could stay in contact until the deal was done. He wasn't too worried. This guy seemed professional, and it was the same procedure for most of his purchases. My friend told him to ship it in a movie case or something that his mom wouldn't expect to have drugs in. This was probably his biggest mistake. He let the man know he was just a teenager, but my friend isn't the most careful of people. A few days later, his mom walks in the room and hands my friend a movie that he had ordered online. He took it and opened it, but inside, there wasn't any cocaine, just a piece of folded paper. He opened it up and read, There has been a problem. Email me for details. At the bottom, the man had left a new email for my friend to contact. My friend got on his email and asked the guy what the problem was. He responded, Something has happened. If I were to send it to you, it could be traced back to me, and we would both be caught. Meet me at the elementary school at 7. We'll just do it in person. The school wasn't too far away, so my friend told his mom he was staying the night at my house, and he headed off to meet the man. He called me and asked if I could be there with him, but I was really busy with schoolwork, so I, I said I couldn't. I did tell him to take a knife or something though, just in case things went south. When he got to the parking lot outside the school, he heard a car honking its horn. He saw it was a jeep, but the plate had been covered up by duct tape, and the windows were tinted very dark. 
The man got out of his car and gave my friend the drugs, and my friend paid him. It seemed like everything went fine. My friend got in his car and sat there a bit in order to call and tell me everything was fine. He noticed when he had hung up, the man was still there. Why was he waiting? He didn't think too much of it, so he drove off. When he got to the first red light, he noticed that the man's car was right behind him. He was starting to get a little nervous, but kept driving. When he reached his neighborhood, the man was still following him, so he decided it would be a bad idea to lead him right to his own house. He instead turned into the next neighborhood and took a whole bunch of random turns, hoping to lose the man. Eventually, he no longer saw the car, so he pulled into his garage and called it a day. That night, he noticed the sound of a car engine. He looked out his window and saw the man's car, parked in his driveway. He got wide-eyed and snuck downstairs and peered through the window. Inside the car, the man was smoking a cigarette and talking on the phone. But in the passenger seat, he also saw a second man. The second one was a lot more suspicious looking, even more so than the shady drug dealer man. The second one had messed up hair, a trashy shirt, and while it was hard to see, my friend could almost make out a scar from a massive burn on the side of his neck on his face. He kept watching the two men until the second man began to look at the window more and more often. Eventually, he was just staring at the window my friend was watching them from. My friend decided he had enough. He was going to call the cops. He didn't care if he would get in trouble at this point. He moved away from the window and called the police, who told him to grab a weapon or something to defend himself and wait for them. He had waited about five minutes when he saw a figure quietly come out of his mom's room, who was still sleeping. The man shut the door behind him and noticed my friend had seen him. The figure sprinted towards my friend with what looked like a knife raised in his hand. My friend grabbed a pot from a nearby table and threw it at the figure. It hit him in the face and shattered. The figure screamed and fell to the floor. My friend turned on the lights and saw the second man with the burn, rolling on the floor. His face was covered in blood and shards of glass sticking out. His right eye had tons of blood pouring out. He must have hit him pretty hard. As the man began to slowly get up, my friend grabbed a kitchen knife and drove it into the man's shoulder. Another scream could be heard by the man. The man began to stumble over to the front door when police sirens could be heard. Both men were caught on sight, but my friend's mom had been killed. Her throat had been slit and she had 23 stab wounds and duct tape covering her mouth. My friend was arrested too for drug possession. His trial is coming up, but he lost his mom because of it. I don't think he'll be buying drugs from the deep web anytime soon. I'd actually seen him on our way home from school. He looked dirty and disturbed and stared at us as our bus went by. We even made jokes about him, probably as our way of pretending we weren't afraid. He was incredibly out of place in our middle class suburb so his mere presence felt threatening. Thus, our panic when the three of us got off our stop and saw him at the corner, about to look in our direction. He was between us and our houses, and the bus had already pulled away, so we bolted for the buses of a nearby yard. We weren't sure if he had seen us, but we peered through the leaves and saw him stalking our way, muttering randomly. Tim, my neighbor insisted that he'd seen a large knife in the man's ragged clothing. Danny, a kid I hardly knew who had just moved into the neighborhood, insisted that he was imagining it. That Tim's glasses must have reflected the sun wrong or something. Still, we were terrified, and the sidewalk was going to bring him right by us. 
It was Tim that broke and ran first, keeping low. I followed, my heart pounding as we dove into the darkness underneath the porch of the unfamiliar house we'd been hiding near. As we squeezed our bodies against the dirt, the grimy wood pressed into our backs, barely giving us enough room to breathe. From our hiding place, we could see the disturbed man turn into the yard in front of us and begin searching around, hitting the bushes and muttering angrily. I realized then that Danny wasn't with us, but I hadn't seen where he'd gone. Tim had lost his glasses back at the bushes, and he just huddled in the shadows next to me in a near-blind terror. We stayed there in silence, waiting. Every so often, whenever I almost thought it was safe to come out, footsteps would creep across the wooden porch above us. Tim almost sneezed once, but I covered his mouth and nose in stark fear. We waited there so long that the tone of the sunlight began to change. We hadn't heard the man searching about in a while, and I was just getting ready to peek out when footsteps clattered and a thud hit the wood directly above us. A split second later, Danny's face appeared in front of us upside down, and he looked at us through the lattice. A look of shock and surprise crossed his features finally finding us. He whispered something, but I couldn't hear anything. He seemed to be saying, come closer. So I figured the horrible man was still around and we had to be quiet, and I inched forward. Danny's features grew fearful and he kept indicating something above us. Strangely, I still couldn't hear him. His eyes seemed to dim then, and I inched forward a little bit more. I froze for a moment in horror, then backed up. Tim mouthed to me, what did he say? And I just shook my head, completely in shock. Danny hadn't conveyed, come closer. He had mimed, he's up there. The drifter was unknowingly sitting right above us, waiting, because he knew we had to be somewhere in that yard. There was nothing to do but wait in silence, trying not to scream. I was glad Tim had lost his glasses. I lay there as darkness descended, waiting in unwavering terror and trying not to let the glassy stare of Danny's severed head as it rested in the grass a foot away. This man is a fool, nothing more than a peasant. Nothing in his life ought to be pleasant. Indulges himself in his deepest desire. Believe nothing he says, most likely a liar. If I were him, I'd take my own life. Those damned children too, and that bitch of a wife. It serves no purpose other than just to live. His own volition tells him not to give. Procreation is banned with those wretched genes. They shall be extinguished through masterful means. My voice is suppressed through this bastard's will. Wife is a feminist and kids are on pills. Problematic schools, to say the least. Corruption runs rampant even with the police. New diseases every day, from where do they come? Ebola, AIDS, cancer, just to name some. Congressmen who failed to come to terms. I hope each one of them dies and then burns. Ignorance is my bliss, I can't handle no more. I can't fight this battle with the wolves at my door. Every child's fear. You remember the feeling, don't you? The feeling that you're being watched. That if you make the slightest movement, you're dead. Everybody had that fear as a child. You wake up in the night, can't get back to sleep, shuffling back and forth from one uncomfortable position to the next, hoping to find a way to sudden slumber. You give up. There's no way you are going back to sleep anytime soon, so you simply turn to your side and stare out the window. The road, the lights, the trees, all seem so strange under the cover of night. You try to keep your mind quiet of any distractions, remembering that you still need to sleep. And that's when the feeling hits you. The feeling swarms over you like an ice-cold blanket that has just been spread across your back. 
you remember that it's night, and that night is when fear likes to hunt. You feel almost as if you are being watched from behind. You can't see it, but its eyes are trained on you. You want to move, but you can't. If you do, something bad, no, something horribly wrong is going to happen to you. The only thing you can do is remain quiet and still, and hopefully it won't notice you. As you lie in your bed, frozen in fear, if only you could quickly grab your bed sheets and throw them over yourself to hide your body from whatever evil monstrosity stands behind you. It could be done. Perhaps, if you're fast and precise, you could succeed. You decide to think no longer. You flip yourself over and grab your bed sheets with both hands. Without looking around the room, you swipe back down, covering yourself with a thick blanket. Safety. It is then that your mind comes back to you, and you remind yourself that there is nothing there. Darkness clouds the mind and it causes it to hallucinate. With the only limitations being your imagination, you slowly poke your head out of the sheets and scan your eyes around the room. Nothing. You place your head back on the pillow and slowly drift off to sleep. This is every child's fear, and parents always tell their children to go back to sleep, and that it's good for them to work through their fears. They're wrong, because what they don't know is that when the children hide under their bed sheets, the real fear is not what is standing over them, but what is staring at them from under the covers. Our story starts in the material plane far away from Galarian solar system. This is where the giant monstrous Mosquito Glonder, or as his devout call him, the Gossamer King, whom some say grew out of the corpse of a dead god, found a new home hidden from Desna on a planet called Thoria, where he would feed on the heart blood of his faith's truly devout. Now Desna, an ancient goddess of freedom of luck, whom legends claim accidentally freed Glonder from his cocoon, was searching across the plains for him to fix her mistake. Desna found Glonder on <clears throat> Desna found Glonder on the planet Thoria on the material plane and tried to reason with him to turn from his evil ways so that she would not have to send him back to his cocoon of jail or worse destroy him. When Glonder would not agree with Desna's terms, he tried to flee from her, but ne but Desna caught him and attempted to entrap him back in his cocoon, but failed. So instead, she trapped him inside the ice-bound caves in the frozen heart of Thoria. With Glonder temporarily trapped in the ice-bound caves on the planet Thoria, Desna traveled to the outer sphere to seek guidance and wisdom from the Nettis, the god who holds magic above all things. Desna asked Nethys, to remove all planet travel to and from Thoria by placing an anti-planet shield around the planet. Nethys agreed, but to cast a spell around Thoria to stop all planar travel, he would need specific components. So he made 19 magical crystals of small, medium, and larger sizes. Nethys gave the crystals to Desna and asked her to travel to each of the 19 planets and collect some of the planes and collect some of the plane's planar essence into the crystal. Desna had collected 18 out of the 19 crystals she had on plane left to visit the abyss. The abyss surrounds the outer sphere like the impossibly deep skin of an onion. The layered plane of the abyss begins as gargantuan canyons and yawning chasms in the fabric of the outer planes. Bordered by the foul waters of the river Styx, coterminous with all of the outer planets, the infinite layers of the abyss connect to one another in constantly shifting pathways. There are no rules in the abyss, nor laws, order, or hope. The abyss is a perversion of freedom. 
a nightmare realm of unmitigated horror where desire and suffering are given demonic form. For the abyss is the spawning ground of the innumerable races of demons among the oldest beings in all of the great beyond. Once Desna reached the abyss, she collected the essence and was about to leave when she noticed Pazuzu approaching her. But before Pazuzu could get to her, Desna surrounded the crystal in a magical spell and hid it in one of the many canyons. Pazuzu, the self-proclaimed king of wind demons and patron of all that is evil and flies, was drawn to the essence-filled crystal and felt its great magical power. He captured Desna, tortured and held her prisoner claiming that the essence stone was stolen from his realm and demanded it back. Desna managed to escape and she quickly fled to the canyons, recovering the crystal and returned to Nethys and returned to Nethys with the last of the 19 essence crystals. Nethys scattered the 19 crystals throughout Thoria and with all 19 crystals in Thoria Nethys placed an anti-planar shield around the planet. No mortal or god would ever be able to enter or exit Thoria for eternity. Party Chasing by Teddy Halloween is by far my favorite time of the year. The one wonderful day where walking around with a mask on is socially acceptable. Masks hold quite a unique place in society. A mask can transform anyone into something else, turn an actor into a character, hide the secret identity of a superhero, or even allow monsters to walk among men. You never know what's behind a mask until it's taken off, but that's the best part of Halloween. No one is going to take off anyone's mask. There's no gang of teenagers with their talking dog there to strip away my disguise and reveal the truth underneath. No, this is reality and on Halloween I'm perfectly able to hide in plain sight. Of course, wearing a mask has its own special meaning for me. I'm not an actor, superhero or even a monster. Not in the fictional terms at least. No, I simply use a mask as a means of entry. Any mask works really, so long as it covers my face. I manage to use a different one every year. All I need to do is walk the streets of my suburban neighborhood, weave my way through various decorations, and dodge packs of trick-or-treaters until I hear the familiar blaring of loud music. Like a sailor to a siren at sea, I'm drawn to the music, to the party that it emanates from. Yes. This is why Halloween is wonderful. No one seems to ever ask questions at the door to a Halloween party. All I really need to do is knock and wave when the door opens. The mask makes people just assume I'm there for the party. Hell, sometimes people just leave their front doors wide open, allowing even easier access to their home. On Halloween, no one gives a second glance toward a masked man making his way through their midst. Which is what makes my hobby oh so fun. They are completely oblivious as I approach their food. They continue to chatter and gossip as I add my own special ingredient to their bowl of punch. They continue to dance and play as I slab small sharp needles into their chocolates and sweets. It's not until their first friend drops to the floor, either choking on my poison or coughing up bloody needles, that people start to panic. It's the same every year. As soon as I leave the party and hear the chaos rising behind me, an unstoppable grin forms under the mask. Screams of terror are such a pleasant noise for such a pleasant holiday. Dark days, dreadful indeed, promiscuous peasants planting their seed, foreign to peace with galvanized hate, with doubt in ourselves we submit to the great. We say we are free, but tend to conform, hand you a noose if you're out of the norm. We proliferate lies and refute the truth, give up our ambition to feel aloof, 
Please, O oh, help us, powerful God. Stop those who lie, kill, and maraud. We have succumbed to infinite darkness. He may have created us, but has surely departed. This happened a couple years ago. I was 17 at the time, and I spent the majority of my time gaming. I always watched people do Let's Plays on YouTube, and I always wanted to do them myself, but I could never afford the equipment, and my family was far from rich. So I just made do by playing games. A lot of the time I would just talk while I was playing and pretend I was making a video. I know I'm a nerd. <laughs> but after years of use, my PS3 finally broke on me. I spent all my time gaming on that thing, so for a few days I had no idea what to do. I eventually found myself browsing the internet for free entertainment. That was when I stumbled upon a few videos talking about the deep web. Originally, I had absolutely no interest in it. But then I started hearing the horror stories about it, and I felt like I had to check it out for myself. It took me a while to figure out how to work tour, but I eventually found out how to get on and spent an entire night looking at shit. I read about crazy science experiments, learned a bit about encrypting, and I even found some decent porno. The deep web was nothing like I imagined it to be. I pictured all these evil people torturing children and selling drugs, but I didn't really see anything like that. I eventually found myself in one of those live video feeds with a cam girl. I typed in the chat box for her to take her top off. A few seconds went by with her just staring into the screen, and my screen went black. It was so sudden and abrupt, it really startled me. Then some plain white text appeared on my screen reading, You shouldn't have done that. I replied, Why are you doing this? After a minute or so, the apparent hacker replied to my question with a picture. It was a picture of my house. I could tell it was taken from Google Maps, but I couldn't figure out how the hell he got my address. I started getting really freaked out at this point and tried shutting down the computer, but it wouldn't shut off. I'm coming to get you, then appeared on the screen in big red text, and I could feel my heart pumping through my shirt. It dawned on me to unplug the computer, but by then the damage was done. I knew my parents wouldn't be home for a few hours, so I went in screaming to my younger brother. I told him about it and we both went to the kitchen to grab some kitchen knives. We both waited in the bathroom ready to kill until our parents got home. I didn't want to get in trouble, so I decided not to tell them about the whole thing, and I made my brother promise not to either. I figured that guy had probably forgotten about me at this point. Oh, how wrong I was. About a week later, my brother and I were playing extreme frisbee in the front of the yard. I needed another water bottle, so we took a quick time out. I went in to grab the bottles while my brother stayed outside. When I got back outside, I saw a large black van speeding away. I could hear screaming coming from inside. I called my parents and then the police and told them what had happened. There was a big to-do about it and there was even an article about it in our local newspaper. I knew what happened to me on the deep web had something to do with the kidnapping, but I didn't tell my parents or the police about it. I have never forgiven myself for doing that because I know it may have been the tiny difference that could have saved my brother's life. If you're reading this, Jonathan, I'm so sorry. Though the deep web has some good uses, it also has an incredibly dark side to it. The dark web is a small corner of the deep web containing the stereotypical content, bulk drugs, child porn, etc. that the deep web is notorious for. I took my first steps into the little excavation of mine into the darkest parts of anonymous sites under the surface of web browsing in an attempt to undermine the stereotype that the deep web is more a home to dark illegal websites than anything good. Well I came out of this with more than I could have ever expected, and now my view on humanity in general has forever been changed. It took me quite a while, three to four weeks to get enough information to start really delving deep into what I will now refer to as the dark web. The small corner of the deep web that is basically the house of horrors. Lots of talking around, honing information from chat rooms, and taking lots of notes. 
even had to make a couple of phone calls to some more than shady individuals. Not a comfortable experience. By the end of my trek of gathering as much information possible at the time and getting a good contact list, I took my first steps into the outer layer of the dark web, so to speak. The hard part is that once you get deeper, a lot of sites have ever-changing URLs, extensive invitation queues, and at times, pricey entrance costs that may or may not end up as cash spent on a phony operation. A lot of it is luck, meeting people at the right time and place, and taking good notes. I had a good streak of luck and took good notes, enough to get me to the places I entered. But what I did notice is that once I got into the first site that I will next talk about, it became much easier to get into other sites, as it was much more freely talked about and information was passed around much more. Chat rooms in the dark web equal information honey hole. First site? Centrix. I knew I had broken the barrier when I got into Centrix. A good example to compare it to would be Agoratha or Silk Road. Now Centrix, from what I hoarded via lots of questions on the chat room over the course of a couple days, has been around for about 11 months and has been untouched by any means of being shut down, which surprises me because it has everything from Agoratha or Silk Road but to a much greater extent and a lot more variety. What some sites dedicate their whole selling product to be, Centrix had subcategories for. Just a brief few examples, snuff films, bulk drugs, all varieties, fake everything, IDs, licenses, you name it, a very censored section of CP, various illegally obtained memberships, Netflix, porn, etc. The list goes on. Another thing that is a bit chilling is the fact they took a great effort to crack down on scams. The big deal on sites like Agoratha or Silk Road is that they have a lot of scam vendors. This site didn't, and they had a lot of proof to back it up that I will not go into detail on. I also met a guy in a chat room that was nice. As far as that goes for an active dark web user like himself who verified hashed some of the links. I had collected and vaguely sent me in the direction of other sites for my personal use. This was a great help and led me to my next site, which from the illegality and general morale of the site is what I consider the next layer or gate into the dark zone. Second site, brinkwarehouse.otc, yay, a site with a normalish name, Brink Warehouse was actually quite fascinating. Not horrific to an extent, but had a different kind of dark backlash. Brink Warehouse, a virtual warehouse of textual guides, notes, leaked documents, torrented books. Now, at a summary, this might seem alright, but take into account that the guides include things like how to make a drone-based homemade explosive and how to kidnap adolescents in their sleep. Illegal leaked documents galore anywhere from U.S. classified cases to foreign affairs. Also included guides on illegally modifying weapons, joining terrorist groups, guides to scripting and nulling bank accounts, so on and so forth. Not a fun site. The next site I headed to was where it starts to get formally creepy. The site with no name I got access to, which I consider to be the start of the darkest of the dark web. From Francis turn 344 who was in the chat room on shit.chat a very common deep web chat room site that most of you probably already have stopped in on well talk comes to talk and we end up on the topic of snuff films how common they are where they are usually filmed and why i get his trust we resume this chat in a private room that he had and keep in mind that only getting information was my main reason for chatting i'm not into snuff films though they do fascinate me. We talked for a good 20 minutes before, without me having to ask, hooked me up with the site. We are just going to use a tidbit of the site's all number URL to name it, so 5611 it is. Now the site required an invite, extensive registration, questioning, and a one-on-one -on -one meeting with what I assumed was a site director or admin. He, she was one harsh motherfucker, and the stern punishments for breaking the site's rules was laid out. The guy who invited me, Francis Stern 344, 
I guess was a longtime user on 5611, who had permission to let me take a tour of the site now. Now, I did ask for a formal site name for future reference, and he said that the site had no name, and that it was purely based to display its content and moderate membership. The title, he said, the title, he said, would only make it easier to identify, which they did not want to happen. 5611 had a small membership that, he said, the runners of the site tried to cater to very fondly, as membership is 1.588 bitcoins monthly, approximately 355 US dollars. Upon entering the site, I had to check the Are You Older Than 18 box for the fifth time since I started getting signed up. Finally, I was in. The site's design was bland and blocky, with a pure white background and very blocky, close together writing. In the top right corner, there were the options to log out, add funds to my balance, and then a small wallet emoticon that displayed an empty Bitcoin client side balance. But that was barely on my mind. My mind was on the center of the screen, in a single row down the center of the screen. Single frames with captions and a description took up most of the screen. The top one had a still of a table with various blades and blunt weapons laid out. The title, 24 year old female sleeping, suggested death. With a 2.25 bitcoin price tag along the side, a timer in green text was counting down. 11.51, 11.50, under the timer in the same green font was 78 over 100. A couple seconds later, the 78 turned into a 79. Realization hit me in the face like a bat. This was a paid snuff site. With a shaky hand, I scrolled down through the seemingly endless snapshots and captions. One caught my eye. Quick watch. Homeless. 0.22 bitcoins. Large view. Low Q. It was like an attention whoring YouTube title, but it seemed to be working. In the eerie green font, 783 over a thousand displayed, a jaw-dropping number in my eyes. I decided this needed to be documented, so I did a quick transaction, put my 0.3 bitcoins in my site wallet, and clicked on the arrow to enter. It took a minute or two to complete the transaction, and after about a five minute buffer, I was in the showing. There was no chat box, only a slightly lighter border of gray and static. The same green timer was now in the bottom right of the screen, the square blurred revealing a city street. What seemed to be Arabic writing was on various shop signs and advertisements. Light from a street post gave a fuzzy glow to the scene. The cameraman, from the position of the camera, seemed to be leaning against a wall. The shot focused on a dinky red junker on the street's curb. From the side of the camera's view, a gloved finger points towards the entrance of a dark alley where a man lays on his side, like a breathing pile of rags, obviously homeless and alone. The finger makes a motion towards the car and three men quietly exit the car and walk along the storefronts towards the sleeping homeless figure. Quality is total shit, but the scene can still be made out and is enhanced by the horrid imagination about what is to come. About five meters from the homeless victim, the lanky group of thugs pull out plain white theater masks from their jackets and take out various small weapons and pounce around the corner onto the innocent, unsuspecting victim. The camera picks up the quick shuffling of feet as the cameraman runs towards the scene, catching the thugs thrashing and stomping the man from his slumber. Cut him up! Cut him up! The cameraman's thickly accented voice commands the thugs, who begin to slash the victim at a wild speed, like hyenas tearing into a caught prey. Blood sprays onto the wall and onto the thugs' white masks. It is horrible. My stomach barely holds on. I can't take it. Logging off tour, I take a few more security measures and shut off my computer. Taking some deep breaths and sipping from a Coors Light, my last visit on the dark web, Candy Palace. I logged on about a week later and never thought to go back on 5611. I never contacted anyone from my past sites and I knew in my heart that this would be my last visit to any site on the deep web. I was thoroughly encouraged not to go on, because with 5611, it had really been in my mind that last straw. I had really proven to myself that the dark web, even though it has some good parts, is really just a beacon of humanity's horrific actions. 
I had proven to myself that sites like 5611 and the other sites exist, but I just felt the need to cover the last huge part of the dark web that is in my mind the worst of it all. Child pornography. Candy Palace is a huge site. Do some digging and get some sources. You will find it. From the videos, I have come to the conclusion that it's all hosted in one location in a foreign country. I always wondered that if there are all these snuff films and child sex slave dungeons that are often spoken about, that there would have to be a suitable amount of missing children cases and unsolved murder cases going along with them. Some research and asking around concluded that many of the film's murders and child porn director rings are in fact in foreign countries, where getting away with these kinds of actions is a piece of cake, in the words of an aspiring director in Candy Palace chat room. I will not go into specific detail about any one video on Candy Palace. I'll only lay out some basic stats and descriptions and let you find the rest if you so please. The main chat room had several hundred chatters in total between the various subchats. They actually had a very detailed profile of each child. An example was Tatasia, 9 years old, black hair, and then included a list of, if I remember correctly, 83 videos she starred in, and counting. The children were usually smothered in makeup and besides for what seemed like designated 2-3 to three stars, not extremely physically hurt via evident beatings. Double penetration, binding, gay, force one-on-one, -on -one, knife, roleplay, chamber, and dungeon were the top video tags. Each video has 1-2 to two tags, if I remember correctly. There were a total of 17 stars. Nobody ever brought up anything about if they were kidnapped, imported, imprisoned. All anybody cared about was watching, so getting information on that topic was hard. Most of the scenes are filmed in various sets, such as aerosile dungeons, surgery rooms, etc. No grimy bedrooms or warehouses or basements. Nothing that fits the common stereotype. It was basically Pornhub with a pink, white, black color scheme and 6 to 12 year olds. It's a nightmare. Conclusion? I never look at people the same. Throughout taking this research oriented trip through the dark web, my view on humanity has been changed. Every video I watched in the name of research chinked away at my emotions, often left me crying. Curiosity broke me and it has been nearly a year since I have fully recovered. This is my, I guess, case file for my research on the subject. Now before you launch tour and find these sites, please know, there is nothing enjoyable, entertaining, or at all suitable content on this network. You will be left in tears, you will be scarred, and worst of all, you will never view others the same again. It started with my friend in Japan. He was a hacker and pirate and always left his computer on, along with AIM and MSN. When he logged out on both, I assumed his computer finally died from overload. It was then I noticed all his posts on our favorite sites were gone. All his accounts, all his videos, all his comments. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. My name is Nathan and I'm a shut-in. Agoraphobia. I live in North Carolina and I program for a living. My sister does the shopping for me and I live in a basement. No windows. That might very well be the only thing that's keeping me safe. I woke up a month ago at 3am and sat down at my desk, ready to work a bit, but mostly chat. That's when I noticed Chaos Rider was gone. I don't know his real name, so don't bother asking. Besides some spelling issues, he was a fairly good English speaker, and I enjoyed talking to him. He also knew everything about computers, stuff I could never imagine possible. That's why I wasn't worried. It was well within his expertise to hack into sites and delete his own posts. I assumed he had gotten sick of the internet. He had been complaining about it for years. I tried discussing his disappearance with a mutual friend. He seemed confused, like he was forgetting who Chaos was. This friend was really old. I worried about his mental health. I decided to let it go and talk about sports a bit. 
By this time, three or four people had stopped logging on. Not the most unusual thing in the world. People got busy sometimes or just didn't feel like talking. Only, their posts disappeared as well. Now it had been a couple of days since Chaos went missing, and I was getting fairly freaked out so I turned off the computer and watched TV for a bit. That's when shit got scary. One of the news anchors was gone. The other would sometimes look at the spot her partner should be and look confused for a while, only to return to speaking as usual. A local show called Three Sisters or something was now two sisters, and yes, the third sister was gone. As with the news, sometimes there would be times where the third sister was important and for a moment they seemed to remember, but then they just kept acting. A cooking show just showed the studio with no host. I'm a rational man, and I was quick to rationalize everything. The news anchor wasn't used to working alone while her partner was sick, and the show with the sisters was part of a plot I wouldn't know. I didn't watch it. The cooking show was harder to explain. Perhaps they left the camera running while they had to leave for some reason and the network guys didn't notice. I had calmed myself and decided to watch something else. I got a TV guide my sister had gotten me and flipped through it. That's when I noticed the freakiest thing yet. The Two Stooges. I stared blankly at the name, squished between an old Britcom and one of those shows about how good the 50s were. It was soon to start, so I flipped over to the channel. Sure enough, the title screen said The Two Stooges. Surely this was some joke or a ripoff. But no, it started as I remembered it. Only with one less stooge. I freaked out and turned off the TV. So here I am. It's been a month and around a hundred people are missing that I know of. My sister is gone as well. I'm posting this on every site I can, hopefully reaching as many people as I can. If you can notice the people missing as well, my name is Nathan Creek and I live in a small town in North Carolina. Please private message me as soon as possible. Hey Bob, Bob, help me out here. The man stared at the computer screen furrowing his eyebrows. What do you want, Jim? Bob walked over to him, a bored look on his face. One of the AIs has a glitch. How so? I deleted several other AIs and an entertainment pack so I could install the new versions. But this AI didn't delete its memories and is panicking. I thought it was the lack of a support AI because I deleted the sister file as well, but the memory logs showed it started much sooner. He's been at his computer for hours. What's he doing? Working? Creative writing? Autobiographical diary, it says. I thought we didn't install that module on this one. It's probably a glitch of some sort. Just delete it and do a clean install with the others. Jim sighed. I kinda like this one. It's just a program, Jim. It's not like it's sentient. Jim watched the visual representation of Nate Creek 5 typed furiously. I guess you're right, Bob. Jim right-clicked the AI and chose delete. was the night before Christmas and all were asleep. Little did they know they were being watched by a creep. He'll sneak into their house in the darkness of the night. He'll walk around in their rooms to the left and to the right, staring at their little faces, hoping they won't awake, munching on the cookies that they previously baked, plotting an evil plan the way he always does. 
and anticipating murder. No reason, just because. He's supposed to be a jolly fat man, not an evil troll. But I bet you'll change your mind when he steals your soul. When I was younger, I was really close with my father. He died when I was 11, but I have always been fond of my memories with him. I remember the events leading up to his death. Him and I were sitting in the backyard throwing rocks into the small pond on our property when he stopped for no apparent reason. He was such a lively person. When he went blank, it was really noticeable. I looked up at my father and said, Dad? No response. I was really frightened at this point. He was just staring out into the darkness of the woods just beyond the pond. I looked in the general direction in an attempt to see what he was seeing, but to no avail. After about a minute of sitting there, in complete silence, he snapped out of it. I asked him if he was okay, and he told me not to worry about it. I found some of his personal papers a few days ago to find he wrote about that experience. He claimed to have seen the evil eyes, as he called them. He predicted they would take his life. I questioned my mom about it and she told me he spoke about it a few times, but she didn't think anything of it at the time. Whether or not these eyes contributed to my father's death, I may never know. But last night when I was with my son, I started to see them too. Long I have watched you, and long have I wanted you. Long have I devoured your kind, and will always feed upon you. As much as you deny me, you perceive me and acknowledge me through your subconsciousness, creating me to exist. I am the ever darker shadow that lays dormant within the pitch black. I am the flickering shadows that your peripheral vision witnesses only at an instance. I am that breath you hear that is out of syncopation to your own. That fear that grows within you, that denies you to face the darkness in your room. Because within the seclusion of absent light, I sit patiently, waiting for you. I am the grotesque being within your closet. I am that which lies somberly under your bed. I feed on you as I have fed upon your elders for centuries. As much as you deny me, in time, I will surround you and become your world. I manifest into forms and always watch you, waiting for my time to grow and swallow you. My insatiable hunger engulfs every being on this earth. I gorge on the ever-pressing fear. With my blanket of twilight shadows, I still wait and watch you. You can feel me now, brushing your hair ever so slightly, making you twitch and writhe. But when you awake in alarm, you cannot see me. You feel my presence behind you. But when you look back, although you sense me, I am not there. My eyes are always upon you. And in your fear, you look back at them. I shall remain long before you pass and still feed. I am the fly on the Ark of Noah, the cloud that corrupted Cain's vision. I am the one who was responsible for the descent of Lucifer. I am darkness, waiting for you to plunge yourself to me, waiting for you to fall asleep, waiting, watching, feeling. How can I allow my own descent, although betrayed to the fullest extent, a somber feeling mixed with melancholy, 
he who hesitates is lost. Reminiscent of times we had been jolly. You won't do to me what you did to Faust. My soul may ache but shall not act folly. Into the abyss I shall not be tossed. My wife was adulterous but this fills me with dread. How can I ponder? Am I insane? You don't need to wonder. She's better off dead. I'm not external. I'm within your own brain. Now do as I say. Put a bullet in her head. The Rituals of the Forest Back in 1986, when I was in high school, three friends and I were hanging out at the Friendlies in Mountainside. It was a Saturday night, and we were bored out of our minds. So when my friend Chris said, Hey, let's go to the Watch Hung Reservation, we said okay. All but one of us had heard the rumors about devil worshippers hanging out in the reservation, but none of us really believed it. Anyway, when we got up there and parked next to the Magic Forest, beyond the Magic Forest, what was called the Witch's Forest, I have no idea how these sections of the woods were given these titles. We got out of the car and walked toward the Magic Forest. We had walked a few feet into the woods, which were pitch black, when we noticed lights flickering deeper in the woods in the Witch's Forest. At first, we thought it was a bunch of kids partying, until we heard what sounded like the most unearthly moan or wail from a woman. We were so scared that we all grabbed hands and ran out of the woods to our cars. I will never forget how scared I was. I could literally feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Another story I heard from a classmate who happened to be an Eagle Scout. He and some other scouts were hiking up in the reservation one day when they came across a stone altar-like structure which had what he believed to be bloodstains. The Leaper In the watching reservation, there are a series of trails which all lead in one way or another to Surprise Lake, which lies within the mountains. My sister, her dog, a good friend, and I decided to take a stroll in an area known as the Magic Forest. It was early spring and everything was really muddy and slippery. As we were walking along, the dog's ears perked up and he started barking like mad. The three of us saw nothing and continued to walk on. The trail leads down to the lake where you have two steep inclines on either side of you. They are not good walking grounds. Out of nowhere, we saw this man running down one of the inclines at incredible speed and then he leaped across the path to the other side of the mountain. This was totally weird. The dog was still barking and we had all stopped in our tracks because the distance this man jumped was impossible. And the fact of the matter was, he never stopped running. He kept on going, leaping along the way. We continued with our walk and couldn't get the dog to calm down or the image of the strange man leaping across the mountain out of our minds. Somehow, we got to the trail which none of us had ever seen before. We decided to take it, because it is pretty difficult to get lost up here, since you usually end up at Surprise Lake and from there you can get your bearings. As we walked on, the dog, who had calmed down again, went completely berserk. Ahead of us was an old red barn-like building, which had scorch marks around its window frames. As we got closer, we realized that squatters might be living in it because there was garbage and clothes everywhere. The weirdest part were the animal pens, which were on both sides of the building. There were no animals, but there were what looked to be like blood trails all over the dried up grass. There were also burnt candles placed in a circular pattern in the animal pens. We decided to hightail it out of there. Over the years, many stories have filtered down about satanic rituals that have occurred in the mountains. We'd ignore these stories and still cruise around there at night to spook ourselves out. On one occasion about eight years ago, 
I was driving around the mountains with my sister and a good friend. As we were rounding a curve, we saw flames in the distance. The cops and fire department were streaming in, and as we rolled by, we noticed that this wasn't any ordinary fire. It was a perfectly designed circle with a pagan star in the middle. It was the creepiest thing. How the Suicide Tower got its name. Our state has a legendary example of teen angst expressing itself in what has to be one of the most gruesome cases of murder in New Jersey history. It was 1975, and Mountainside was a quiet suburban community nestled right next to the Watchung Reservation. Greg Sanders was 15 years old and lived with his parents. Thomas, a banker, and Janice, a teacher at a church nursery school. He attended the prestigious Pingry School in Hillside, where he was an honor roll student. Greg was a kid with a lot of potential. His freshman year, he played football, and his sophomore year, he managed the team. He was a solid student, particularly well regarded for his writing ability. In college, he planned to study either law or medicine. He had always pushed himself and had been pushed by his parents. Greg had always felt a lot of pressure to do as well as his sister had done throughout her scholastic career. Kids from his neighborhood remember how Greg was not satisfied with being a B student. They would tease him about it and often call him a mama's boy. The combination of parental and peer pressures eventually took their toll on the young man, and with deadly consequences. On January 15th, Greg left school at 4.55 p.m. Everyone who had seen him on his way out said he seemed fine, but he wasn't. Greg went home and wrote a suicide note. As his sister later told the New York Times, for reasons which will never be known to me or to anyone, my brother could not cope with the pressures of his life anymore. He decided, probably, on the spur of the moment, that he could not stand it anymore. He wrote he was sorry for any trouble or distress that he caused for anyone by what he was about to do. What he was about to do was to end his own life. After deciding this, Greg realized the pain he would cause our parents with his death. The only way he could die in peace, knowing he would spare our parents from pain and sorrow, was to end it for them too. That's right. In his twisted mind, Greg decided he would spare his parents of dealing with his suicide by killing them. So Greg took an axe and attacked his father in the dining room of their home. As his father staggered away, Greg hit him in the back of the head five more times, caving in his dad's skull. He left him lying dead on the kitchen floor. His mother, who had heard the commotion from upstairs, came rushing into the kitchen, only to be axed to her death in a single blow. Having already written his suicide note, which graphically described what he was planning on doing, Greg took off into the freezing January night wearing only a t-shirt and a pair of khaki pants. He went to a popular makeout spot at the time, a 150 foot tall water tower in the Watch Hung Reservation that had a staircase circling up the outside of the tank. Greg climbed to the top, then slit his left wrist and leaped to his death. At around 11.15 p.m., four kids who were exploring the reservation came upon Greg's body. In the weeks that followed, people tried to figure out why Greg did what he did. Rumors spread that he had been full of cocaine, but toxicology tests proved this to be untrue. It remained a baffling mystery, as one neighbor said, he was the most normal kid on the block. He didn't break any windows or anything like that. He was the last kid that you would expect to do this. These days, Greg's story is one of the most recounted tales of the area in which it occurred. A sad story of a confused kid who went to an awful extreme.
dear friends, family, and community. I knew I shouldn't have come back to my hometown, this small secluded place stuck in the hills of the Appalachia, where I know everyone. Just wasn't the right place to start my business. I'm sorry, Nadine. Love, Amelia Brown. That's the note she left us, and that was the end of Amelia Laura Brown. We closed down the morgue, her morgue, and gave away her things. She was so proud of her business. Throughout town, they said she did the best work from Boone County to Nashville. The only strange part was that she always dressed her patients, as she used to call them, entirely in white. No color sprawled over the icy corpse, no flashy makeup, a little red lipstick for the women, and a red nose for the men. She was too young, too young to die, too young to be in this business. Our parents told her that being a mortician was not a profession for a young lady, but her fascination with the dead overruled their complaints. She went on to mortuary school and then came back home to start a business. When asked, all she could say was, I don't think I fit in anywhere else, which was saying a lot because she could hardly fit in anywhere. There was no niche in any part of school she could slide into. I guess not even when she went off to college and then to mortuary school where tons of people fascinated with the dead flock. At least, I think that's why people go to mortuary school. I've never been too curious about the outside world though. I haven't been out of Bryson City since I was a baby, and I never even finished high school. What do I need to know about the world? But Amelia had a passionate love for biology, always wanting to find out how humans worked, and how we were born, and later on how we died. Maybe it was fate that she became so infatuated with life. Maybe it was fate that led her back home. Maybe it was fate that killed Nadine Wiggins in that car crash. I've always been a firm believer in God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. I go by the Bible. I pray every night and before my meals. I go to church every Sunday. All my babies are Christian. It's almost like Amelia and I were opposites in every way. And I may believe that statement, but damn, she was still my sister. And I still cared a whole lot about her. I know she felt the same way about me. I prayed for her soul every day, hoping she would turn around and see the beautiful light of Jesus Christ shining on her and be entered by the Holy Spirit and shout to the heavens for joy. I guess that some people are just not meant for God. My husband says they're wrapped in sin, but I knew enough about Amelia to see that there was no devil in her mind, just a loud machine full of gears, like a clock, always ticking, ringing, wiring, on and on and on. No wonder she snaps. But last year during November, when we give thanks that Amelia had the chance to be on this earth for a while and change our lives, we decided to visit Amelia's old home. A couple of my cousins had moved in, but they didn't mind us, and we ate and drank and laughed. The kids ran around in the yard and built a bonfire, and we all sat around telling stories. I had heard a crash upstairs and yelling, and I figured the kids were roughhousing again, so I went to check on them. I came in and fixed a few scratches and then booted them out the door. The problem was the broken bed. I didn't want my cousins to know the kids broke their bed. So I tried to fix it myself. I lifted up the top end that had fallen, but it was too heavy so I let it go. It landed with a big thump, and then I heard a softer thump as something fell from the end of the bed. I looked under to see a book lying on the floor and picked it up. It was titled Agony in Black, and had a screaming girl with red eyes and inverted black and white on the cover. I was drunk so I got pretty scared. I stuffed it inside my coat so the kids wouldn't get a hold of it. It was probably my cousin Frank's. I thought he always liked to read comics. Propping up the bed on a stool, I found I started to feel dizzy. So I lay down on the bed and closed my eyes. Next thing I knew, I woke up to the chirping of the birds, but the house was silent. I sat up and looked out the window to see the smoldering ashes of the fire. And then I started to hear faint snoring from some of the other rooms. I stood up, but as I did, something fell out of my jacket. 
I looked down to see a white piece of paper and I picked it up. Realizing it was the comic book with the screaming girl, I turned it over and looked at it again. It was in a plastic taped slip and the white piece of paper covered up the back. Looking under the bed again, wondering where the hell this thing came from, I saw the tip of something sticking out of the hole in the mattress. I got underneath the bed and grabbed whatever the tip was and pulled it out. Sliding out from under my bed with my prize, I sat down again and looked at what I snagged. It was titled in red letters, Serenity in White, and had a black and white photo of someone sleeping with red lipstick on. It was a book bound with twine, and the pages were yellowed and had and the pages were yellowed and had some holes in them. In the upper corner someone had written in the red pen, property of Amelia L. Brown. I remember saying aloud, oh my god, and then realizing that my cousins had kept all of Amelia's furniture in the house. Looking up I saw that the sun wasn't up yet, so everybody would take a while to wake up. I set down serenity in white, took agony in black, and out of its cover, it was full of stories, horror stories I guess, and some weird vampire ads. This was apparently Amelia's, and she had circled a mailing address to buy a book titled Poems for the Dead. The strange thing was that Amelia had never been into comics. She preferred books over what she used to call cheap thrill rubbish. I guess this one had caught her attention though. Flipping through it, I read that it had been published in the fall of 1997. I skimmed a couple of pages, but there was nothing else circled or underlined or marked in any way. I put it back in its cover and turned to Serenity in White. Obviously she had chosen to mimic Agony in Black with the title and cover. I opened it up to the first page and as I read, I realized it was Amelia's diary. Nobody had found it for 16 years. My shit for Brain's cousin hadn't even bothered to get rid of her stuff. The first date was June 7th, 1993. June 7th, 1993. I finally finished school, and now I'm back home. My parents are begrudgingly proud of me, and I told them of my plans to uh, open a morgue. I skipped a few entries and got to the grand opening of the Brown Morgue. March 19th, 1994. I've done it. I have successfully started my own business. We had a party after I announced it was open, but soon I'll have to start working. I already had a call from Mr. Waldrop that Mrs. Waldrop is dying, and he needs my services. I feel so sorry for both of them, but I am so excited for my first patient. She'll be beautiful. Amelia's morgue, being the only facility of its kind for another 20 miles, became the town's main spot for their dead to be handled. Amelia was so tender with her patients and always helped the loved ones get through their losses. But by now, I knew what I was looking for. And soon enough, I found it. October 18, 1997. I can't bear to think of it, let alone write it down. Yet, I must do both. My friend, my only friend, Nadine Wiggins, has perished. Her family called me yesterday in tears, telling me that she had been drunk and died in a car crash. A collision is what killed her. They say they know that I'll take the best care of her body, and they want me to be her mortician. October 19th, 1997. Oh, if only it were that simple. If I could just detach my mind from her body, from her being, then I could face what lies in the basement. She'd been down there for one day, and I can't sleep at all tonight. I have to start my work tomorrow, and I tell myself that soon it'll all be over. I had no idea what happened next. I knew she was depressed after Nadine died and had taken to drinking, but I never, never had a clue of how far her depression went, how far it stretched until it led into madness. October 20th, 1997. I sit with her body tonight. 
I lifted up her body and held her, though no tears came. Music swelled in my heart, and we danced. And we were once more together, the dead and the living waltzing to a song only I can hear. She is in her white dress, with her beautiful red lipstick on, and I am not ashamed to admit that I let that rose colored mine own lips. I imagine us dancing through the graveyard, both of us dead, colder than the night air, skin as pale as moonlight, skipping from gravestone to gravestone. Our eyes stare into hell, but no regrets lie behind them, only love, <laughs> love as pure as dew, silencing grass over graves. How I wish I could bring you back, Nadine. October 21st, 1997. When I am buried, I cannot dance with Nadine, for my body will be old and decrepit. She will be dust. Maggots will have eaten out her own eyes, those beautiful brown eyes, and her tongue and all the soft parts, and I will have turned to Dutch much sooner as an old woman. But maybe we can dance. Maybe there is a way. October 22nd, 1997. I have worked on so many familiar faces. I wonder if it is worth it to come back home. Gregory Myers, Jessica Dyer, Frederick Wilson, and so many more, all gone. So many of my schoolmates have passed away, friendly faces are dead, and I start to picture everyone with pale skin, those eyes searching for life, the limp body. Whenever someone dresses in white, I shudder. Red lipstick and red roses are no longer beautiful, they only symbolize the end. October 24th, 1997. I've always known that everyone will die one day. It is why I am so fascinated with death. How could one person filled with so much energy and thought and feeling simply collapse and mean nothing more? I try to bring out their beauty show their passions, and make known their names. I want to make the memory of them last for as long as it can. That is why I'm a mortician. This is my destiny. Nadine still sits in my basement. She waits for her funeral. October 27th, 1997. I attend Nadine's viewing and funeral today, and everyone has told me she looked beautiful. I hid her behind layers of white, and her red lipstick sat dully on her lips. What an ugly specimen. The worst I have ever done. Her family cannot see what beyond what covers her. They cannot see Nadine for who she was. They only see my beauty. I am so selfish. My destiny is not to make beautiful your loved ones for rotting. It is to show my skills as an artist using a body. I skipped ahead to a couple days before November 4th, 1998. October 31st, 1998. I wrap my hands around my throat and hope to a God that I don't believe in that this will be easier than I think. I've seen so many deaths and I don't know the best way to die. They're all so messy. <laughs> Oh God, why do I even bother? I have to keep my family proud of me. I visited the road to nowhere today, and I listened to the wind tell me I was going to die. It smelled like horse shit, and the graffiti on the walls was obscene. Life is so ugly. I've never been a very happy person, even as a child. Why wouldn't I kill myself? I've seen enough sadness to pass a lifetime. What's left for me now? An empty home and heart? I remember when 
cousin Carl took me up to a tunnel and raped me till the floor was slick with blood. I remember members of the Ku Klux Klan following me home from school because I did not believe in God. All I know is horror, and all I know is despair. That is all my empty life. I am a walking tragedy. I visited Nadine's grave as well. There was some sort of dead flowers on it. November 1st, 1998. Nadine has been heavy on my mind this last year. The day she died was last month, the anniversary of her death, you could say. I don't eat anymore, I don't go out. I attend my patients and sometimes, with the aching in my heart that Nadine has left, I dance with them. The men in their white suits prick my fingers with their roses and the blood drips down my arm. The women in their white dresses paint my lips as red as my blood. But the children I save the special dances for. We hop and skip and I twirl the small girls around. They are all so perfect, so beautiful. I truly am an artist for the dead. November 2nd, 1998. My sister came by today. I told her I wanted to see her. This was my last goodbye to her. She has always been there for me, even though we were so different. She noticed my pricked fingers and I told her that it was from picking out all of the roses. She asked who my latest work was on, and I told her it was little Charlotte May. She said, Oh, I remember how that girl loved to dance. What I didn't tell her was that she still does. November 3rd, 1998. Tomorrow is the big day. I've called up mother and father, and Charlotte May has been buried. Everything is neat and tidy in the house. I hung my rope from the top of the staircase. As long as I don't receive any visitors, I will be fine. November 4th. 1998. Goodbye. And there it ended. The sun was only barely over the mountains. I prayed that Amelia was right and there was no heaven or hell. I tucked the two books into my jacket and then woke up my husband and the kids went home. That night, after everyone had fallen asleep, I drove out to the cemetery beside the school and looked at Amelia's grave. The flowers we had put down yesterday were wilted and lay strewn across the ground. I looked around for Nadine's grave and found it covered in live wildflowers. I looked at the moon and behind me I heard the soft steps of the dead as they danced through the grass, their skin as pale as moonlight, their eyes searching a hell they didn't believe in, their howls of victory ringing through the night air warmer than their blood. You lie face down in the ground, your face pressed into the newly manicured spring lawn. You spit, forcing out the few blades of grass which found their way into your mouth in between the small gap of your front teeth. Three six foot tall jocks stand over you kicking and throwing out more insults than an anonymous political activist on Facebook. Blow after blow, your oppressor's attention diverts as a large SUV blasting some incoherent rap music pulls up and honks the horn. After spitting on you and delivering a few final blows, they get in and drive off. After which you get up and brush yourself off. Evil be to him who evil thinks. In short, the proverb means bad things will come to those who think or wish bad things for others. And boy, should there have been something in store for Chad the leader of your oppressors. As you about face and start walking home, you can't help but notice an old man sitting on a porch a few houses away. His empathic stare tells you that he pities you, but you're really not in the mood to relive the embarrassment which occurred only minutes ago with a complete stranger, and you're sure this old man wants to offer his sympathy 
Hell, he may even offer stories of when he was bullied and rose above the situation. You're already late for dinner, which pisses Dad off. The walk home used to be a peaceful time for you, until Chad and a couple of his goons started making it a habit to harass you. Every time you see him now, you press your fingers so hard that you feel as if your palms will be penetrated. He's the kind of guy that gets anything and everything he wants out of life. A girl you could only imagine having. A ruling spot in the social hierarchy of the local high school. And two parents with prestigious positions and plenty of wealth. That SUV you saw earlier did belong to him after all. And you couldn't even afford to use your father's car with the price of gas. It dawns on you that one of Chad's friends drove the SUV, but you couldn't bring your inner FBI agent to mentally investigate the situation. When you get home, you move with mere rote, setting the dinner table. Your ears fill with another round of complaints from your father's workday. Funny thing, he works with Chad's dad, who also happens to be his boss. You see how unfulfilled your father is and can tell how envious he is of Chad's father's position. Dad always wanted to be the boss. He even had a chance at it until mom passed away. Things got really hard for you and him after that. Chad's father is your father's superior and Chad can fuck with you as much as his heart desires. You know dad has a hard time at work and trouble with the boss's son could have severe consequences. So you suffer in silence. But no one knows just how much you're hurting. Every night before you go to sleep you ask yourself, why you, of all people, had to be placed in such a poor predicament? The next day, after sitting in a cold hard chair that made your ass number than any amount of opiate ever could, and staring at the long hand of a clock move slower than a union worker, you got the hell out of English class. Disappointment fills you when you see your recent test score of 63%, but you're happy to be the hell out of there nonetheless. Chad makes sure to rub in his near perfect score and remind you that one day he'll be your boss just like his father and your father. You had grown accustomed to the constant insults and put downs at this point and don't even acknowledge his snarky little comment. To a degree, you know he's right. Between your self-defeated father and lack of your own confidence, you gave up on stopping him and just did your best to avoid him. You barely make it a block from the school when they attack you again. Frustration and shame fill your pores when they open your book bag and throw the contents into a muddy puddle. So much for doing that extra credit for English, you think, and keep your head covered throughout the rest of the beating. On the walk home, you see the old man from the previous night. You really don't recognize him aside from yesterday, which is pretty weird, considering you've been walking this way to and from school every day since you could remember. The house was never for sale, you think to yourself. He shoots you an inquisitive look, and you get a weird feeling from him. Just something about him was different. You feel compelled to ask the man why he was staring at you so intently, so you naturally walk over. It isn't until you are only a few feet away you realize something odd about him. He has the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye. You feel your blood run cold and your senses heighten. I saw you with your friends last night. Those guys are anything but my friends. No point in being a king without peasants to torment. But why do people like me have to suffer at their expense? I never did anything wrong. I mean, why can't those bastards find some other way to inflate their ego that doesn't involve whipping my ass every day? He takes a step closer towards you and brings his face closer. With his one eye gazing directly into yours, he says, Come back tomorrow and I will have the solution to your problem. This really just pisses you off even more. A solution to my problem, you say? My dad is a loser. My loving mother has been dead half a decade, 
I get pummeled to shit nearly every day, and some old man, who probably doesn't even live in this house, has all the answers. Is that right? He gives you a sedated stare, and you can't tell why, but it actually convinces you he has something up his sleeve. Without uttering another word, you turn around and walk back home to hear more unenthusiastic bitching about the monotony of the office. As you lay in your bed, you wonder what the old man might have in store for you. The thought of him handing you a gun and telling you to shoot your enemies down ran through your head. But that was no solution to your problem. The problems in your life couldn't be fixed with a couple of bullets. After the last bell rang, you follow the rest of the sheep to the exit of the school and begin your stroll to the house in solitude. You're happy to find the ogreish gimps have something better to do with their time today. When you enter the house, your eyes fixate on the eye of the man. Well, what's your solution? I can tell you have become emotionally numb in many ways. You don't connect with other people like you were once able to. What the hell does that have to do with any of this? What if on top of giving you your life back, I could also make you truly feel again? You're a generally skeptical person, but something about the man seems like he was genuine. You're unable to explain the feeling, but you know he's not just an ordinary old man. That would be nice. You say... The old man points out his index finger and sticks it right into your chest. You gaze at him with uncertainty, but hope. Whatever bullshit he tries works. Three seconds go by, and you start feeling an unbearable pain in your chest. The pain envelops you as everything slowly turns to black. When you get home that night, you can't help but to sympathize with your father about his day. It just feels like a whole different experience to you now. More than a week goes by, and you start doubting the old man, until you get home to hear your father's good-for-a-change news. Apparently, Chad's father made a complete ass of himself somewhere gambling, and ended up being talked about in a story on the news. He was fired from his job, and your dad was happy to take the promotion. He secretly despised that man all these years, and to finally step up, was a big thing for him. The idea of the old man having anything to do with this crosses your mind, but you chalk it up to be no more than a coincidence. But when news got to you that Chad dropped out of high school, you're convinced. Initially, it's great. You finally feel like you could live your life without someone attempting to shit on it. That isn't even the best part. Angela Pamberton started hinting that she likes you. You! Of all people in the entire school, she was best friends with Chad's girlfriend and you always dreamt of being with her. You never thought in a million years that your most sacred sexual fantasy would come true. Not soon after, you find yourself on a double date with Angela, Jake, and Emma, the most popular couple in the entire school. You secretly told yourself that these would be the kind of full of themselves degenerates you would never intermingle with. But you don't feel the resentment anymore. It's been replaced with aloofness. It was like you can be your dopey self and they loved you for it. Yo Jake, pass the popcorn my man. Sure thing playa. Emma asks Angela if she'd accompany her to the bathroom. Angela turns around as they scurry off. She gives you a flirtatious look, one that makes you realize just how lucky a guy you were. Jake leans inward toward you to whisper something. Emma told me that Angela really wants you tonight. You are so in there, man. You blush and shake your head in disbelief. Jake went on. I'm serious, bro. According to Emma, Angela wants you to be her first time. I thought she already lost her V-card a long time ago. Nah, man, that's just people talking about something they don't know anything about. I have been her friend a long time, and she has barely so much as kissed anyone. You're sure he can read the excitement on your face. The girls return from the bathroom. The rest of the night is smoother sailing than a newspaper boat in a kiddie pool. Everyone says their goodbyes and departs. You and Angela hold hands on the way back to your vehicle. 
You hold open the door like the chivalrous gentleman you are. She giggles in response. You walk behind the car and do an embarrassing hope she didn't see that dance out of excitement. Holding her hand in yours, your heart jumps and you bring the car to an abrupt stop. You see Chad, half naked, walking in the middle of the street, obviously pretty far gone. He turns around and meets your gaze. An odd feeling of guilt washes over you. Here he is in the middle of the street at whatever godforsaken hour of the night, and you just couldn't shake the feeling that you were responsible. The old man kept his word. When you get home, Angela insists on staying the night. The first time you will ever make love in your life, and you spend the entire time thinking about the overwhelming feeling of guilt that's building inside of you. You didn't want to see Chad and his father suffer. They may have been asshats of human beings, but they don't deserve the extremely unfortunate hand they were dealt. As soon as Angela falls asleep, you tiptoe out the room and start the car. You need to find the old man. It takes you about the same amount of time to get to the house as it did to finish with Angela, so it was a pretty quick ride. You rush in and slam your arms on the door. The door startles you when it crashes inward and bangs into the floor, which makes a noise that probably interrupts the neighbor's sleep. There is no one to be found. You search the premise up and down so thoroughly J. Edgar Hoover himself would have been proud. But there is nothing here to suggest anyone lived there in over a decade. You think back to your experiences with the old man over the past few weeks. Can you even trust your own memories? How can you live with yourself knowing that you could be responsible for ruining the life of another? This has been a strange and confusing path. I never intended on becoming a serial killer or harming people. I was a social reject for many years. I was picked on in high school and often ate lunch alone, sometimes even having to eat in the bathroom. I wasn't so much bullied as I was just flat out rejected. I saw the pretty girls in my school and I always longed to have a girlfriend of my own. Someone to hold and love like nobody else ever could. But that was never possible with my current social standing throughout high school, or even into my college years. My mother, who raised me alone, was never able to afford a cell phone for me. But when I got into college, I worked at a local McDonald's, and we were able to each get a phone. With some luck, we were both able to get iPhones for a relatively low cost. We didn't get too much data usage with our plan, but we were happy nonetheless. I downloaded a bunch of free games, avoiding the social media apps. I'm sure you can imagine why. About a month went by, attending classes in hopes of becoming a writer someday. I made sure to help out my mom wherever I could, and I did my best at my extremely remedial job. I was content with my life for the time being, but months passed and life became monotonous yet again. I found myself laying alone at night, imagining what it would be like to feel the warm embrace of a woman. I downloaded a few dating apps online. I got one that forced you to pay for a subscription to message people. I deleted it once the realization hit me. I got another and there was not one woman who messaged me back. I couldn't figure out why though, my profile picture was nice looking and there was nothing weird about the profile I created in general. I found myself at a loss when I realized that none of the women on that app wanted anything to do with me. I was searching through the app store when I came across it. Tinder. I loved it the second I downloaded it. I didn't bother to swipe any girls to the left. I liked all of them just to up my chances of being matched. 
I was matched with four women within the first week, but unfortunately, none of them responded to the messages I sent them. But finally, on the fifth match, I got a reply to my charming compliment. We hit it off rather quickly. We exchanged numbers and she told me she had just broken up with her boyfriend a few days prior and was looking for new guys to talk to. I know this wasn't exactly the ideal relationship I was going for, but I was beyond desperation at this point. We spoke for two weeks before arranging a face-to-face -face meet. I sat in the coffee shop feeling a bit anxious as I received a notification from my phone. It was her. She couldn't make it, but asked if we could meet another time. I agreed and headed home with disappointment. After that day, she started acting differently. When the only way you communicate with someone is through text messaging, you learn their tendencies, how long it takes to reply, use of emojis, and unnecessary capitalization. It was taking her longer to text back, and her replies were shorter and shorter by the day. It got to the point that she was sending me one-word replies every other message. She was like that for three whole days, and on the fourth day, stopped texting me altogether. I couldn't figure out why, and I asked her if I had done something wrong. By this point, I felt a real connection with this girl, and I had even gone as far to tell my mom about it. When I received a text message from her that she would gotten back together with her old boyfriend, I felt the world around me come crashing down. I finally had someone to be mine and she was stolen from me. A few days passed and I just laid in my bed feeling sorry for myself. I couldn't bring myself to leave my room to a world that didn't care for me. A world that left me to my own without giving a second thought to my well-being. A week had gone by when I texted her again to see if she'd broken up with him again. I felt the blood in my face boil when I received a picture message of her and her boyfriend flipping off the camera. A text message followed shortly after telling me the size of my penis would never be enough to satisfy her. I'd never felt so hurt and betrayed in my life. It was one thing to use me until something better came along, but now she was intentionally setting out to hurt me. I wanted nothing more than to kill the both of them but I wasn't sure if I'd be able to do it. Maybe if I just saw her face to face, we would be able to work it out. I know this will sound weird, but I still loved her. I did some detective work and figured out her address from her Facebook account and headed there the following Saturday. I was greeted by the beautiful blonde still wearing her pajama pants. The look of shock on her face told me that I was the last person she'd expected. I told her that I loved her, and we should be together. She laughed and slammed the door in my face. I couldn't even describe how hurt I felt at that point. I was humiliated and rejected, and I'd had enough. Rage rushed through me, and I blacked out. When I came to... I was standing over the corpse of a blonde 20-year-old with blood everywhere. I almost puked when I realized what had happened. I just murdered a woman in cold blood and I was going to spend the rest of my life behind bars if I didn't do something quick. I raced upstairs to what I assumed to be her room. I grabbed her phone and deleted all my contact information. I must have gotten lucky because nobody was around when I sprinted back to my car and sped off. I did my best to take my mind off the intensely grotesque situation by going back on Tinder. I swiped until I ran out of likes and then headed off to bed. The next day I awoke, I had been matched with a girl who seemed interested. I simply couldn't help myself when I messaged her. After I got her number, we spoke about our previous relationships. I told her I would just be heartbroken if my last relationship were to repeat itself.